Confirmed by the U.S. Senate in August of 2017, the Honorable Ellen Lord currently serves as the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. In that capacity, she is responsible to the Secretary of Defense for all matters pertaining to acquisitions and the defense industrial base. Prior to this appointment, Ms. Lord served as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Textron Systems Corporation, a subsidiary of Textron Incorporated. In that role, she led a multi-billion dollar business with a broad range of products and services supporting defense, homeland security, aerospace, and infrastructure protection for customers around the world. In addition to her more than 30 years of experience in the defense industry, Ms. Lord previously served on boards and task forces for a variety of organizations, including the National Defense Industrial Association, the U.S. India Business Council, the Center for New American Security, and the U.S. Naval Institute. Thank you for joining us for this Reagan National Defense Forum virtual fireside chat, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Secretary Lord from the Department of Defense, welcome to the podcast. We're really excited to have you here uh, on Reaganism. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. Great to be talking to you and always a fan of the Ronald Reagan Institute. Well, that's, that, that's great to hear. And we do appreciate your participation in the Reagan National Defense Forum. And, and we're excited to have this one on one conversation uh, just for our viewers and listeners. Uh, Ellen Lord is a name now known to be the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment in the Department of Defense. How did you get to this role? What's your background in the world of the military and the aerospace and defense industry? All right. So I began life as a chemist, actually a little bit of a nerd in the lab <laughs> and worked in the automotive industry for about 11 years for a multi-industry um, corporation that gave me the opportunity to move segments into aerospace and defense where I was for about 22 years. So I worked my way through general management and then to run a segment of the corporation and had a lot of interaction with DC, with DOD, um, back and forth. And one day was incredibly surprised to get a phone call asking me to be um, a political. And I had no idea what that um, meant. I said, thank you very much. That's flattering, but no, thank you. I'd love to be on a board. And <laughs> reflected on that for about a week and thought about what it meant and decided that it was time to give back. So I entered um, the world of DOD via a lovely hearing on the Hill, had no idea what that was all about. Um, <laughs> so um, here I am. So very, very pleased to be here. And, and, and of course, you were a CEO of uh, an important uh, 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 defense company. Coming into the you know, E-Ring and the Pentagon, how important is it, is it uh, to you on a day-to-day -day basis having that industry background to carry out your work as the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment? It's very important from my point of view because I think I bring a different perspective than those who have been in government their entire careers. They obviously bring a very, very um, incredibly important perspective as well. But I have experience with what it's like trying to do business with the government and perhaps understand some of the challenges, particularly with communications and understanding what is going on. So I really try to be the voice of industry inside the government and also try to explain how we do the things we do and why we do them. Well, you know, let, let's jump to current events and, and your role has really been pivotal for the Department of Defense in navigating the COVID-19 crisis. Kind of explain to everybody why the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment really finds in your, you know, herself uh, in, the, in the kind of the ground zero for the Department of Defense and its response to COVID-19. Well, frankly, I look at the defense industrial base as the nexus of economic security and national security. And the defense industrial base is one of my primary responsibilities. So I thought it was really incumbent um, on my team to get out and start communicating very, very quickly. And I'm incredibly fortunate to have very, very talented individuals with a variety of backgrounds who rallied and we decided that 
we would work through our industrial um, organizations uh, that we typically use to sort of amplify and echo what we have to say. And we use them as convening forums to be able to start transmitting to industry what was going on and frankly, more importantly, to listen to what was happening on their side because our job number one was to get everybody back to work. Again, to maintain readiness, but also for economic security for the country. So economic security and national security when you're in an industrial base, those are hand in hand. I mean, it's over, what, 10,000 companies that you're keeping an eye on? And give us the latest numbers. Well, um, I'll tell you, what we do is we track two different groups of companies, one through the Defense Contract Management Agency, which tend to be a little bit larger um, companies, a little bit over 10,000 there, and then through the Defense Logistics Agency. Um, for more of the vendors, um, we track about 11,000. So I actually have a few numbers here because what we did was we convened three times a week meetings with industry associations. And then I started holding an every morning tag up meeting at 7 a.m. with our extended team. And I got numbers every day. So from DCMA, um, we started tracking, tracking closures as well as DLA. So we've had 279 closures of companies that DCMA tracks. Um, and 273 of those have reopened, which I am wow. very, very um, pleased about. And I'd like to think that we helped in that a bit. From DLA, they track a little over 11,000. They had 692 closures cumulatively, and 664 have reopened. Now, what we knew was that the landscape was pretty complex initially because local and state governments were putting out shelter in place orders and so forth. So one of the first things I did was to follow very quickly behind the Department of Homeland Security and put out a memo stating that the defense industrial base was critical infrastructure and that they were authorized to work. And in fact, that particular document was actually used by employees as they were being pulled over by local law enforcement, telling them they had to go back home and shelter in place. But along with that, we had to make sure everyone was safe. So we were really channeling a lot of the CDC guidelines on social distancing and so forth. That's pretty impressive uh, numbers. Um, you know, we're looking at what some are characterizing as a second wave. Uh, certainly numbers of infections are going up. Uh, do you see that impacting these companies, the over 20,000, if you combine the DCMA numbers and the DLA numbers? Uh, or do you feel, are you getting word that enough process is in place, uh, the, you know, the PPE, the mask, what have you, that they can continue operating in this environment? I think there will continue to be challenges. However, everyone is much, much better educated now and are proactively um, taking measures. I've been really, really impressed with the CEOs of small, mid, large companies and what they are doing. We're trying to help them. So for instance, um, PPE for a while was a little bit difficult to obtain. It's gotten much easier. But again, to sort of have the easy button to hit, we have opened up what we call FedMall, which is an electronic marketplace at the Defense Logistics Agency to small companies as well as state and local governments. So they can come in and buy PPE in our electronic marketplace. Um, we continue to reach out as needed early on. Um, we had some governors um, where we were concerned that certain critical facilities in their sure. states were closed. They were very helpful. So now they know how to reach out to us as well. We were even reaching out, frankly, um, to our embassy in Mexico um, to open up facilities there as well. So, so once you have all the safety requirements met and the things that make people confident and comfortable, they can work. You know, the other piece of this, uh, which I think is particularly difficult for the defense industrial base, is people are, are teleworking. Right. And uh, if they don't have to be in the facility, uh, you know, we're all working from home, whether it's Microsoft Teams or Zoom or something else. Um, 
How has the department and the defense industrial base responded to that? You know, if you're doing classified work, obviously you can't do that from home. But for those who can carry out the work, I mean, can the department support uh, all that, that the broadband demands. What are you seeing on yeah, that front? Yeah. So um, the demand signal was pretty intense, obviously, initially, <laughs> and bandwidth was somewhat limited um, on a number of fronts. I will tell you here at DOD, Dana DC, the CIO and his team really stepped up to outfit everyone. They had incredible processes with people driving up in the Pentagon parking lot and handing them all kinds of equipment. And then they expanded um, our capability. So from um, an unclassified point of view, things got going pretty quickly and everyone started becoming um, very proficient in how to telework and how to have, you know, 100 people on a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams and begin to really connect. The classified part was a little trickier, but we actually have a lot of super capability out with senior people as well. And then we've been rotating people into SCIFs to keep things going. And I will tell you, readiness has not dropped at all during this time. So really a shout out to everyone's um, huge, huge efforts. I think on the industrial base side, exactly the same thing. Everyone adjusted and learned. And I'll tell you, I have calls with CEOs. We've had Secretary Esper on three or four different calls now. And, you know, people are in their dining rooms and living rooms and home <laughs> offices. And we all just kind of go with the flow. Yeah, you watch CNBC and you basically get an insight to every CEO's uh, living room or, or home <laughs> office. Uh, probably not the same for the Secretary of Defense or the Undersecretary of Acquisition. You know, just, just a couple more questions on the impact industrial base. Earlier uh, in the crisis, you discussed uh, a three-month slowdown. Um, how would you characterize the slowdown today in terms of the ability for the uh, industrial base to, to, to produce, you know, the defense production that's required? We have made amazing um, inroads in coming back up um, to close to the prior productivity levels. Two segments particularly impacted um, that still are showing a bit more of an impact are shipbuilding um, and aircraft production. And um, on the aircraft side of things, obviously, we have a lot of suppliers, um, prime contractors who are not pure play defense contractors. So pure play, and, you mean people who have, you know, commercial and other, uh, you know, dual, yeah, dual exactly. use businesses. Exactly. So we have some aircraft suppliers who are defense only or pure play. Then we have other aircraft suppliers um, who are dual use. So they are both supporting the commercial industry as well as defense. Those dual use providers have been particularly hard hit. And um, sometimes that's helpful to us because they've been able to shift critical resources over to our programs. Um, we do have to make sure that they are right sizing because obviously we can't absorb all the overhead costs that would go with a full up dual use um, operation. So a lot of work going on, um, tough decisions being made, um, but we are pushing through it. Um you know, you mentioned dual use companies, a lot of companies that aren't pure play defense companies, you know, they're, they're, they're doing business internationally and their supply chains are international as well. You know, we've seen this throughout the COVID crisis, almost COVID has done more to teach America about the vulnerabilities of our supply chain than any other uh, matter. Um, how do you see reliance on international supply chains and particular China impacting defense industrial base through this crisis? This has, in a way, been the silver lining for us because issues that we identified about two years ago in our um, 13806 um, report on the defense industrial base. This is the executive order, right? That came exactly. Out two years ago, yeah. Executive Order 13806, um, where we were tasked by the president to look at the defense industrial base. And we did that. One of um, the most useful things that came out of that was we segmented the base. Um, we all had the same lexicon. Then we could identify fragilities. And we identified a lot of single source 
offshore supply chain critical items. So we have used that as a platform over the last couple of years to try to make sure that we um, strengthen that industrial base. COVID-19 brought all of that home and it has allowed us um, in sort of a twisted way to accelerate those efforts. And not only for the rare earth um, elements or the microelectronics that we all know so well, but also for the advanced pharmaceutical ingredients that go into our drugs that obviously are important for the nation and also very, very important for DOD. So we've been able to really um, get that message out and frankly get a little bit more support from Congress and the administration to strengthen our domestic industrial base. So you mentioned microelectronics. You also mentioned pharmaceutical. I mean, that was one of the eye-popping statistics that I think the whole country uh, learned during COVID is that I think when it comes to generic drugs, you know, the ingredients over like 80 plus percent come from China. How did the, how is the Pentagon getting ahead of the curve? And is that particular data point, um, generics and, and reliance on China, something that impacts the force? Or is that a bigger problem for the civilian population? It impacts both the force and the larger civilian uh, population. And we, because of that, have been able to get a whole of government response. So from a DOD point of view, um, we are very fortunate to have the Defense Production Act, particularly Title III, which allows us to take appropriated funds and um, make investments in the industrial base to increase both um, capacity and throughput. But it's also allowed us to shine a light on the fact that it's not only having the infrastructure to produce all of these items, but having a regulatory environment that enables us to move through the safety and certification processes at a reasonable speed. That was part of why so many things moved offshore. We became onerous in terms of our regulations. And now we're coming back to, I think, really trying to adjudicate that and coming up with a reasonable set of standards. Great. So you mentioned the Defense Production Act. That got a lot of uh, play in the press earlier uh, in the crisis when there was a shortage of masks and ventilators. Uh, the Defense Production Act seems to be the vehicle the President of the United States would use uh, to, to make sure that these companies are producing to help them produce and in case they're not to require them to produce uh, and the like. Um, how do you see the EPA being used for the rest of this crisis and then in the future? Uh, is the Defense Production Act a tool that now perhaps some uh, thought was secondary, now is some kind of primary in the mind of an undersecretary for acquisition or the Department of Defense or you know, the, the President of the United States going forward? It is one very, very important tool in our toolkit, I would say. Um, we have used it both for medical resources, whether that be N95 masks or whether it um, be swabs for testing. Uh, we have also used it for our own defense industrial base. So it's a very, very important tool, but it's only one. We worked for about five weeks with our legal staffs um, to find a way to reach into HHS um, Health and Human Services, $17 billion that they received through the CARES Act to be able to transfer money to DOD to enable us to do contracting on their behalf, mm. as well as to do investment in industrial capacity and throughput. So we have taken the billion dollars that we received um, for DPA um, Title III funding through the CARES Act, and we've used a portion of that for medical resources, and then we've used another portion of that for our defense industrial base. So you mentioned before semiconductors was a key vulnerability. That's been known in national security and defense circles for some time. It was a key area of focus in the previous administration, this administration with the national security strategy. To what extent is the Defense Production Act a vehicle, an authority you would use uh, to help in the case, let's say, Intel's looking at building a fab in Arizona. Also recently, we had the announcement with uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Company, also TSMC coming to Arizona as well. Um, there needs to be a variety of incentives for a company to do that. It's important, you would think, for national security to have a domestic 
uh, kind of fabrication capacity for semiconductors, microelectronics. But is DPA a part of that or is that authority uh, too small, not funded enough to really impact that kind of problem that you have with microelectronics? So DPA may be part of the solution. Um, we have basically obligated um, about two thirds of the money, the billion dollars we got through the CARES Act, and we have plans to get on contract the balance of that. Um, we are hopeful there will be a tranche four um, coming along and a follow on to the CARES Act. We have at OMB right now requests um, for more DPA Title III money. But I think the microelectronics challenge is even larger than that. And in fact, about five months ago, my team started um, a study to really characterize the microelectronics industrial base because it's a little bit difficult to understand from foundries to packaging to logic to memory, who are the players, who are domestic, who are offshore. And we have just finished um, a piece of work internally that we are now beginning to socialize in the interagency throughout the government saying we have a challenge in that the majority of the intellectual property associated with microelectronics is generated in the US, but the majority of the fabrication and packaging is done offshore. And that introduces risks to our supply chains and takes away from our economic security. So we are thinking about a whole number of private public partnerships to bring more of that back here. One of the creative ways that we are looking at using DPA Title III is following up on an executive order that was signed out just about a month ago, um, a little over a month ago now by the president that basically gives the Development Finance Corporation authority to use DPA Title III as collateral money to um, grant loans to reshore critical capability to the U.S. So we, again, are working through all the legalities of that, but I'm partnering very tightly with Adam Bowler over at DFC, and we are looking at what are those critical capabilities that we should reshore, both in the medical resources side of things, as well as the industrial base writ large, but where defense really um, has a critical need that then could help industry in general, and microelectronics is one of those. That, that's fascinating, and reshoring, you know, is 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 seems to be the priority. But, but let's go back to basics on that. You mentioned that in the case of microelectronics, but I think it's true for other sectors as well. The United States holds the IP, but the manufacturing, for a variety of reasons, resides offshore. Why is it that that is uh, a danger? If we can keep the IP, what's the vulnerability of it being offshore? Is it somehow that eventually the IP migrates? Or even if you own the IP, you know, the manufacturing uh, is at risk for certain items if yeah. it's not within the United States. There are multiple issues there. One is security of supply. We saw when COVID hit, all the flights stopped, and we actually had what was called an air bridge um, that a group from the Pentagon went over to HHS and FEMA, and we're still supporting them in sort of an emergency short-term way. And what did we do? We set up flights to bring back all kinds of medical equipment and PPE that was produced offshore that we owned, but we couldn't get back here. And this is all of the medical distributors um, throughout the country. So one is not being able to get the supply. That's one risk. Another more nefarious kind of issue we have is that we could have implants in those electronics. So all of a sudden, um, as we've seen in DJI drones, for instance, we have US systems calling home to China. We also have um, the theft of intellectual property. That is very well documented where what we think we license for a specific use is all of a sudden repurposed into capability organic to China. 
Um, another risk is the fact that although we have the intellectual property surrounding design, quite often just as important is the manufacturing know-how. And you accumulate that know-how over time through all the cycles of practicing and producing. I mean, you saw that in your business. You did a lot of international uh, prior to coming to the Pentagon. I imagine that's something you always kept an eye on when you did international JV, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And finally, we lose those good jobs that we really need here in the U.S. So all kinds of risks associated with that um, that we're concerned about. And frankly, it's not only what is done offshore, we are growing more and more concerned about what I call adversarial capital coming in and taking advantage of these uncertain times when there are liquidity issues with critical technological um, kinds of um, systems. So you have small companies, high tech companies that all of a sudden have a liquidity crisis. They sure. cannot get a line of credit. They cannot get a loan. So all of a sudden adversarial capital comes in and acquires them. And then we lose our critical intellectual property. So we are very, very vigilant about that and um, trying to defend against that. And in fact, proactively looking at sources of trusted capital for those very same companies. I, I want to get back to the adversarial capital versus trusted capital in a minute, but you did mention China a couple of times in, in, in the response. Um, there's been a lot of talk about decoupling uh, the United States economically from China uh, in the context of this competition. Uh, you've spoken uh, about the defense industrial base, certainly the defense industrial base and perhaps more broadly our national security uh, innovation base, that would be the primary area, uh, I would think, where decoupling would need to be the area of focus. Those types of technologies and capabilities that are critical to national security, we can't be reliant uh, on a competitor, in this case, in this case, China. Uh, do you find that you're getting support, not just from the defense industrial base, which would be unable uh, pure play defense industrial mm -hmm. base to do business with China. But talk to us about the feedback you're getting now, since you really are the key interlocutor for the Department of Defense with chief executive officers, officers with CEOs, from those companies that perhaps view themselves as commercial but still are critical to the Department of Defense. What is their attitude and thinking with respect to China and the Department of Defense coming in and saying, hey, we need you to bring that back to the United States. We can't have you selling these key capabilities with China. You can't do this joint venture. Talk to us about the commercial environment and the responsiveness to the Department of Defense concerns. So prior to COVID, most CEOs were very, very savvy about the challenges of doing business in China in terms of not being able to really hold on to any trade secrets or intellectual property. And they very much were trying to only have um, more commercial or less cutting edge technology in China. That being said, there wasn't really a compelling reason um, to reshore some of that capability or to do investments domestically. Uh, one of the, I think, beneficial outcomes of COVID is that the general public now understands the threat that China poses. And I'm not suggesting that we become total isolationists. However, critical technology should not reside in China and we cannot be 100% um, dependent on China for things like pharmaceuticals. So I have seen a number of CEOs reach out and have conversations with me about the fact that they're more willing now to talk about a consortium going together for trusted um, microelectronics, for instance. They are also being very, very generous with their time, explaining to a variety of government officials how their business works, what they need, what they don't need. And I will say right now we are in the midst of really some dynamic discussions that I think are very, very exciting because we are on the cusp 
of needing some kind of national policy to make sure we are supportive on the government side of bringing these critical capabilities back. And again, that ranges all the way from capital to make the investments to local and state and federal tax incentives to regulatory easing of burdens. So we really have to look at the entire scope of that um, kind of supply chain, the whole thread, and understand what makes sense. And frankly, as DOD, we have a compelling, urgent, and a semi, you know, large need here, and we can be the leaders and I think have a lot of fast followers. Yeah, as you know, uh, the Reagan Institute uh, published a, a report uh, by our task force, co-chaired by former Senator Jim Talent and former Deputy Secretary Bob Work, where they hit on this exact issue set, where in these key nodes, government really needs to organize in a fashion that can bring in uh, the commercial sector, because so much of the technologies element you're describing uh, really are resident outside the Department of Defense and live in markets that are for, far larger than the defense industrial base. Wasn't always the case in the 20th century, but is the, is the case today. 5G is, is one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be critical to national security relies on the, on the semiconductors and microelectronics that you've described. Uh, but it's kind of interesting as we think about China is that on the one hand, we want to bring uh, the capability, the IP and the manufacturing back to the United States. But on the other hand, we want to sell our technology into those very markets, right? We need, US businesses need to sell into China. How do we weigh and balance that? If we close off the China market entirely, let's say in the 5G uh, uh, sector, then on the out those companies, U.S. companies, really have difficult meeting their bottom line and succeeding. You've nailed the issue right there. And that's, um, again, part of an ongoing discussion amongst Treasury, Commerce, State, and DOD. And so where are the red lines, if you will, in terms of what can be exported and imported? And we're sorting our way through that. As you well know, we've had legislation the last couple of years banning certain companies like Huawei, ZTE, and so forth um, from supplying first DOD and then the government. We have to figure it out. Um, I think eventually what we need and what we are trying to do within DOD is come up with a way that we can get microelectronics with zero trust. So in other words, we can understand whether or not the original design um, had the integrity is still there, whether they are counterfeit parts, whether they have been manipulated in any way. We still are a ways away from that, although we have some pretty exciting work going on. So until we get to that point, we need the trusted sources. But I think, and we've got to figure out what we can sell, what we can import and what we can't. And that's a whole of government effort. However, that's not a long-term solution. We have to get to zero trust, just like getting into networks and so forth. And it's not going to be a digital event from zero to one. We're going to have to crawl, walk, run. And Very that's, I think, I mean, frankly, where we can learn from commercial industry. Absolutely. I mean, they, they need to have, uh, you know, technology they can rely on that they can put into different markets at the same time, not lose their IP, not lose their yeah. advantages of business. So it, it, it is similar. On the other hand, uh, this, the, the, the tools that government uses to date are kind of 20th century tools yeah. in the form of export controls and the like, really kind of difficult to apply to the 21st set, you know, century technology. You know, it's putting an export control uh, you know, on a munition, uh, dual use mission is one thing, but putting on a piece of technology that billions of people around the world rely on use every day is more difficult, right? Right, right. No, and that brings up a critical point here. I've made a lot of comments about industry and what's going on. We in the government um, cannot let um, a good crisis go unused here, and we need to um, really build on how we've learned to do things quickly um, with less red tape, if you will, during this crisis and not backslide and also use this, I think, as a wake up call to do things a little bit differently, as you're suggesting. Um, we are a bit caught up in the past. So that's um, sort of my personal challenge. How do you not lose um, the sort of energy to keep pushing at that every hour, every day, every week, every month? 
Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I want to dive in a little bit to something you've referenced a couple of times already, which is this trusted capital versus adversarial capital. Um, what I think you're getting at, but I'll, I'll ask you to take a minute to unpack it, is as we've looked at competition in China in particular, uh, not only have they stolen intellectual property, exploited joint ventures, and taken manufacturing in the United, uh, from the United States to China, but they've also sought to take their capital and make investments uh, at the venture stage even uh, to own and take uh, U.S. know-how and then migrate it into uh, China, which of course is autocratic and you have this fusion between the Civ mill. Um, how does adversarial capital uh, challenge us and what does trusted capital seek to do to address that challenge? So right now, um, we use CFIUS, Countering Foreign Investment in the U.S., that authority to be able as the government to intervene in transactions and even unwind transactions where we believe critical technology, critical manufacturing capability has been procured by adversaries of the U.S. That's necessary. Um, it's difficult. It's time consuming, but it's not sufficient. So what we believe is we need to get on the other side of this, not only play defense, but play offense. So we'd like to think that capital markets are very, very efficient and that capital finds um, companies in need um, of investment. And then there's a virtuous cycle where everything goes along. For the large, um, the largest part, that is true. However, we wouldn't have this adversarial capital coming in and investing in companies if that was a totally, totally efficient market. So what we have been doing, really prototyping for the last year, is coming up with a rule set by which we can look at companies and understand the beneficial ownership, who actually owns the company, also look at capital providers, whether it's a venture capitalist or even a family fund, understand the true source of their funds, Go through this rule set, um, basically proclaim them clean on either side, and then put them into an electronic marketplace that's kind of like a dating service where one can look at the other. And then we come in as DOD branding saying, here are segments um, of the marketplace that we believe are important for our future. And hey, by the way, here's a company that's gotten a small business innovative research loan. And here's a company that has this and that so that they're somewhat branded by DOD. We have had some live events and some virtual events, but we are on the cusp of actually putting this into an electronic marketplace because we know that there are sources of capital out there looking for investments that not only have a good return, but contribute to our national security. I think there's a huge unmet need for that. It's not simple to do. That's why we've been talking about it for a year and very quietly working in in the background, um, but I have great expectations that in a few months, you're going to see this roll out in a very, very significant way. That, that's fascinating. I think it's, if I understand you, it's going to have a kind of twin benefits. On the one hand, uh, it would counter the adversarial capital, which is objective number one, and perhaps why you uh, focus on this year. But second, it would give an opportunity for new and different types of capital, venture capital, for example, to start looking at the defense sector, the needs of the Department of Defense, uh, where in the past perhaps they haven't focused on it because it was too much of a risk. Perhaps they didn't know if the Department of Defense would really come through on funding the areas where you know some startups said, hey, there's, there's a need for this in Department of Defense. If it gets the thumbs up from uh, the Department of Defense, there, there's a little more confidence that the investment would see a return. Absolutely. And hopefully these could be pathfinders so that you do something for Department of Defense and then there's other applications with just general security and then perhaps just general um, commercial applications as well. So again, we're looking at a virtuous cycle here so that we can be the catalyst to get things started. So virtuous cycle, you know, what I understand means that, hey, we're not going to ask you to invest in something, and then we're going to classify it all and restrict you to a classified DOD market. Is that, did I understand you correctly there? Correct. Correct. And in fact, you know, that's something that, frankly, during my time here, I feel that in the sort of 
super classified, the SAP world, if you will, special access um, programs, that we have held those too tightly and there are only a few in the defense industrial base, typically larger companies that really benefit from that. So we have a concerted effort, nothing to do with COVID here, but trying to reach out a little bit more broadly because there are many, many mid-tier companies out there that have the wherewithal to be a very significant supplier to DOD, but they just can't get an invitation into the club. So we're trying to get them in. So uh, a few more areas of focus, uh, and then we'll have to wrap up and let you get back to the demands of of the Pentagon. Um, But on this point, um, you know, there hasn't really been uh, many uh, new entrants uh, into the defense industrial base. Certainly, uh, you know, one that would have a market cap, let's say, of a billion dollars or more. You can look at Palantir and SpaceX as a couple examples. But there has been an increase of late of, of VC money behind companies that are seeking to support national defense and national security, perhaps not limited to it exclusively, not necessarily pure play, although there are some. Um, Give me uh, a little bit of uh, your perspective as to the change in the time you've been in office of more tech companies entering this space, companies that are trying to recruit out of, let's say, uh, traditional Silicon Valley Mm -hmm. uh, kind of areas. Uh, There's obviously we have Defense Innovation Unit, uh, which, of course, um, you oversee. Tell me about that uh, evolution and, and to the extent that that has uh, really been impacting the defense industrial base and some of the challenges you see going forward to increase their participation. I think that there are lots of tentacles out there reaching to what I call non-traditionals, each of the services, um, whether it be Futures Command or whether it be AFWorks um, or whether it be SOCOM or SoftWorks. There are a lot of good efforts reaching out. We haven't done anything at scale yet. And one of the things we're trying to do with our trusted capital is to leverage all of those very innovative groups. Also, Defense Digital Services, um, Brett Goldstein does a great job with them now, and kind of leverage all of that for the greater good. Um, We found, as I mentioned earlier, that just getting into DOD is a bit of a conundrum if you don't know how to. So we actually earlier this year came up with what we call a welcome mat um, to DOD, which is basically um, a placemat with a whole bunch, it's electronic, but we have printouts of it as well, of hyperlinks for where you go in DOD to get certain information or get your company registered, all those kinds of things. I think the more we communicate that, the better. And I go back again to the industrial associations. You know, during this whole COVID crisis, um, one of, again, the silver linings is that um, for three times, times a week for a long time, now a little bit less. We've had telecons, we've had webinars. So we have reached out regularly to about 15 industrial associations and some that we never dealt with before to push all this information and pull them in as well. So I hope we can um, keep that going. I'm hoping as well that the trusted capital will um, give away for some of these companies to come in. But it really all comes down to communications. And I'm always hoping that industry thinks of our industrial policy team underneath ANS as sort of the help desk um, for DOD and that they'll come in. So uh, one last question in this category, and we'll jump to a brief uh, uh, comment on allies and then end on budgets. But you mentioned kind of need to do it at scale. Um, One metric for whether or not you truly realizing these new technologies bring in new entrants at scale would be programs of record. To the extent uh-huh. programs of record bring in uh, and are awarded to those companies, let's just say that aren't quote unquote the traditionals um, or they're done differently, which is maybe one and the same where it's not a five to seven or plus year window, but actually you're doing turning things out uh, more at a commercial pace. Um, do you see, uh, let's focus on the program of record, for example, a, a change in the way programs of record are awarded and organized uh, in the future in light of software uh, being far more of a focus and relevant than, let's just yeah. say, it had been in the past? Absolutely. Um, one of the largest policy efforts we've had in ANS over the last few years is 
totally rewriting the 5000 series, all the policy around acquisition. And what we've evolved to is what I call an adaptive acquisition framework. So there are multiple pathways. Um, one of the key new pathways is a software pathway, because frankly, most of our significant systems are hardware defined, but software enabled, and you can do many, many turns on that software. So we were very, very fortunate to work with the Defense Innovation Board, Eric Schmidt and the whole team to help us on a software acquisition and practices study that we published. We've just finished the first year's implementation. In fact, on my desk right now, I have that report that's to go to Congress that I have to look at. And um, we are working with the Hill on some pilot projects where we have what we call a software color of money. So it's not the one year, two year money because you don't do software that way. And if we're going to do agile and DevOps, I can talk about this all day. You just need to do it differently. So I'm excited. We have a different way to do software. Secondly, the other thing I'll point out in the adaptive acquisition framework is we have taken an authority that we were given about three or four years years ago called middle tier acquisition. So it's not a rapid, urgent need. It's not a big 5,000 project. It's somewhere in the middle. You don't have to go through the joint staff for the requirements process. You can just get going and prototype or produce something, get it in the field within six months. So you get that experiential learning. That is changing how we're getting into programs of record because we are coming in with much, much more mature mature technology and we can transfer in at a milestone B or C. So um, I'm excited. I think there's much, much more capability to acquire differently, to get um, two programs of record eventually, but there's a lot we can do without a program of record. Very significant money. Software color of money. Very, very exciting. Uh, yeah. the, the congressional staff will have a, a field day with that with that color <laughs> of money. That's a, All right. Let, let's wrap up here uh, under Secretary Lord hitting on two subjects and, and then we'll let you get back to your duties. The, the first is we talked a lot about reshoring uh, the need, uh, how we deal with uh, kind of critical uh, requirements of defense industrial base and fundamentally has to be uh, CONUS, you know, within within the United States. But obviously between competitors and uh, the United States, our competitive advantages are allies. What's happening on the front with allies to the extent that we can bring them in uh, as trusted partners to deal with the innovation and other uh, items uh, for the supply chain that are critical uh, to national defense that kind of with those vulnerabilities have been exposed during COVID? Absolutely. We obviously have as our second line of effort in our national defense strategy, you know, um, supporting and growing alliances and partnerships. So the U.S. is differentiated from the rest of the world. When we go to war, we do not go alone and our allies and partners are critical. I actually have an international cooperation group um, that has responsibility for over 30 bilateral agreements. I spend um, a significant amount of my time with our key allies and partners. Uh, a very significant portion of that is Canada, the UK and Australia, part of our national technological innovation base, where they have special consideration, if you will, um, for sharing uh, intellectual property, for getting perhaps a little bit more sophisticated technology than others. We have really amped up our cooperative research agreements with those countries in the last few years, and we are jointly working on developments that will be mutually beneficial. So as we go through all of these challenges with not wanting to be solely dependent on offshore capability, we have made very, very clear to our allies and partners how very, very important they are to us. And in fact, um, every so often when a pronouncement comes out of the White House, I'm on speed dial to some of my fellow National Armaments Directors and they're calling me. And you know, even when we get a little sideways politically, the mill to mill bonds are very, very strong. In fact, um, it was somewhat flattering that when we put out the memo 
um, of the U.S. defense industrial base being critical infrastructure, allowing us to get back to work. Um, my U.K. NAD, my Canadian NAD, my Australian NAD all called me and said, do you mind if I just cut and paste um, names and <laughs> um, addresses and use that document? And we're like, hey, please go ahead and replicate it. So we have a pretty tight bond. Do you think that you mentioned those four countries, of course, make a lot of sense and they're part of the, the NTIB that you just referenced. Um, do we think we need to expand that more? Because increasingly, uh, allies and friends are presented with a choice, 5Gs being the most acute example, where if we don't share, if we don't bring them into our side, don't give our allies and friends a good option, they'll go elsewhere, oftentimes to competitor like China. Um, perhaps not for the most sensitive technologies, but even for technologies that are less sensitive but still relevant to our allies and partners and friends, do we need to do more uh, to expand that cooperation, particularly on innovation, uh, so they're not presented with a hard choice? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I think we need to beef up what we're doing with the current INTIB. We're working on that. But there are many others out there that we could work more closely with. One um, of the items that I'm dealing with with a few of my colleagues here that I am passionate about currently is the fact that we have not really revisited what technology we export, I think, in a significant way recently. And I am concerned that sometimes we are losing international competitions because we have, as we have increased our capability, we have not increased the capability that we export in a commensurate fashion. And we sometimes are having some of our potential customers, particularly in the Mideast, turn to Russia or China. You see the same thing in India, for instance. So we are having a very focused discussion on, let's rethink this from a strategic point of view. We might, in fact, be hurting ourselves when we think we're helping ourselves. And a lot of this technology, frankly, the magic sauce is in the manufacturing of it. The technical data package doesn't always give it to you. So obviously, we have to make sure we're very careful not to have things that could be disassembled and understood and so forth. But um, in the next six months, I very much hope to open the envelope, particularly on some of the weapons technology that we can export. Well, I, I can't wait to have you back at the Reagan National Defense Forum so you can tell everybody about that <laughs> in about six months time. Last question before uh, we close this podcast and uh, viewing session out, uh, the defense budget, obviously is, is critical to accomplishing your work um, with COVID and all the spending and the fiscal crisis this country will have to face. Uh, are you concerned that there will be an impact on the defense budget? Uh, a couple of words, perhaps, on why uh, it's critical to maintain uh, defense spending to accomplish uh, much of what we've discussed here today. Mm -hmm. We are concerned that budgets will be flat at best, and flat budgets are actually declining budgets um, given um, inflation and so forth. We believe that not only do we have to maintain readiness, but we know we have to modernize after years and years of not investing. Our whole nuclear triad is in um, the midst of being recapitalized, and we are with zero margin right now in terms of schedule to get that done to maintain capability. So we must invest. And this is why I am so concerned that we get the next version of the CARES Act and we get some money to help um, take care of some of the incremental costs that were brought on by COVID. There are inefficiencies there and we don't want that bow wave to roll on and on and on on um, in terms of making us inefficient for a long time. We also, I think, would be really doing a disservice to the nation and to the world if we do not make programs whole and if we had to take out of hide, so to speak, all of these inefficiencies that were realized and we are being very, very careful to make sure we are only accepting at for government compensation 
very real inefficiencies. But if we have to take that cost out of programs and um, manufacture fewer units, provide fewer services, not have the logistics tail, um, that would be a very bad outcome. Under Secretary Lord, how, just from a scale standpoint, how much is required to get healthy? You mentioned Tron's forum, but he's looking at it. Give us a sense. I mean, not precise dollar value, but, but generally how much more. I, I testified a few weeks ago saying it's in the low double digits of billions of dollars. Okay. So low double digits would be 10 or more. <laughs> if I understand you You're good at math. Great, okay, Roger. Excellent. There we go. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. Under Secretary Lord, thank you so much for joining us here at the Reagan Institute. Uh, we appreciate your participation. We look forward to having you back at the Reagan National Defense Forum on December 4 and 5. Uh, really, this was an excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing. I'm incredibly proud of my team. They've just really been pushing, especially in the last three months. So I um, look forward to seeing you in December. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Bye.